In this demonstration, we're going to talk a little bit about where the uh, that blunt trailing edge airfoil can come from and how you can avoid it. And we'll do a bit of a live demonstration on how to alleviate some of this. So what I've done here is I've loaded in an airfoil from Xfoil that's basically a NACA 2412. And this airfoil automatically comes out with about a 0.2% uh, trailing edge gap. Um, and you can see that here if you go to the Modify tab, the closure automatically calculates what this is. So it's relative 0 0.00252, but in reality it's about uh, a hundredth of a foot in the length units that I'm using right now. So it's, it's, it's definitely there. And kind of like we talked about in the presentation, we can change this from flat and we can either go to round, which, you know, lofts it around like that. But if you want something nice and sharp, you can go to edge, you can go to sharp, you can see there's a slight difference in how exactly these little uh, tessellated bits are being applied. But edge is usually pretty good. And then you can do things like adjusting the closure. So if you don't want to play with the length where you can adjust how this is or even set it up or down using offset, let's say we go back to flat we can then adjust the closure here and instead of 0 0.1 in absolute thickness we just drag it back to zero and you can see that it adjusts the upper and lower surface and collapses that down to a single point that is now a sharp edge all the way along back to this point so those are a few ways that you can adjust these say blunt trailing edges that are brought in from an airfoil file uh, is a very common cause of this and sharpen it back up so that it works in panel mode. Um, let's see. So in the meantime, we can take a look at uh, one of the others that I wanted to show you. And this is a, a bit of a, a dual demonstration. So we've got, uh, we've got a, a basic wing here. I've given it about 21 sections. And under the plan tab, we're going to make sure that our leading edge and trailing edge clustering is good. And then we're going to give this some clustering out at the tip. So let's set that to 0.25. And very quickly, we're going to run VSP arrow in VLM mode for just one point, just to get the point across. We don't necessarily have to set anything else up. We're going to use the shown set and run it. So it's going to run real quick, no problem. And what we'll notice here is the loading looks good, but you'll see that there's this gap right here in the middle. Now that's perfectly normal because in VLM mode in particular, you'll see that each of these loads are being calculated in the middle of the strip. And so it's treating these as the one on the right side and the one on the left. So it's not giving you any information at all about this in the middle. And so it's okay if you see this and that these lines aren't connected. Just know that it's plotting all of these points together in a line because that involves the right-hand surface of the wing. The other side is the left-hand surface. So don't be bothered about that little guy. Now, if we, say, screenshot this, just to keep it uh, in mind, and put that over here for now, we're going to do another demonstration where we do some winglets. So I'm going to show this, I'm going to no-show the other one, and we're going to bump the, the size of this out a little bit, and we're going to watch what happens when we have winglets on this. So in this case, we're at 0.2, so let's make this one 8.8, .8 and make it reasonably similar to that other one. And now we have a winglet set up out here at the edge where it's got a 45 degree bend, and then it goes straight up to 90. And you'll notice that I've got rotate foil to match dihedral turned on right now. If I turn this off, what it does is it flattens this vertical section down into effectively a flat plate. So if I press R, pick a point to rotate around, that's what that looks like. And that's not going to work very well. So if I were to yeah, use the shown set, launch the solver, you can see it's already having a hard time, lots of iterations to try and get down, and you'll see stuff like this. So this is an indicator of a bad solution because there are these giant peaks where something has gone very wrong. 
And that is one of the things that you can use to try and identify where these problems exist. And so if we take a look at that in the viewer, and I'll bring this over here so you can see what's going on. If I show the pressures, you can see that there's this really nasty pressure spike right over here. So it's causing all sorts of issues. If we show trailing wakes, I didn't set it to where it should extend these further out. So you can set far distance to something like 100 to really get this to roll up. But on one side, it seems relatively well behaved. On this side, it's actually like throwing them outward. So already you can tell that there's something wrong with this. So if we come back in here, rotate the foils, and take a look at this again, now you can see that the foils are all rotated to be effectively normal to the surface here. And it's following the dihedral, bends around, and then this has some thickness. So you'll notice out here in the corner that uh, OpenVSP is trying to make sure that these are all normal and uh, it's kind of blending it in as you move along. That's okay. Uh, I know it's not the absolute full thickness of this airfoil that's supposed to be there, but it captures pretty much all of it. So if we go ahead and launch again, we should get something that looks quite a bit better. Now this is more like it. You see that we don't have any of these weird negative peaks down at the bottom. You know, we have a section of the wing where there are a whole lot of points being computed effectively out at the edge of the span, but we knew that. But you can see that the distribution is relatively similar. So if we come in and take this snapshot, and then we're going to bring it over here, paste it in and do a side-by-side -side of these two solutions, then you can see, well, if I had been smart and put my scales where they were supposed to be, Effectively, what's happening is the winglets are moving this span loading out farther. So you can see that really it doesn't drop off until about one. So here at the edges, this little drop off where you lose something out here is getting pushed out. So it is capturing the effects of the winglet. And if we were to come in to launch the viewer and take a look at this as well, you'll see that the pressures are all nice and even and that the trailing wakes are all well behaved. So looking at that, there aren't any weird pressure spikes. And in fact, if we come in and take a look at the contour legend, this is all, you know, order of magnitude expected behaviors, especially here in this primary region, we're only going from about zero to ballpark of negative two. So um, everything is looking good there. Let me back out of this a little bit and clear up my workspace uh, so we can talk a bit more about this. Let's see here. So I suppose while I'm at it, I could show you uh, an example of, say, a vertical forward face or a blunt trailing edge failing in panel mode. Um, let's see if I can bring that up. Common model release. Let's take a look at that. That's a different one. So apologies for the uh, delay there, folks. I'm trying to find the one that works well enough for us. This might take a while. And part of the reason this model takes so long to load into OpenVSP is because there are a whole lot of propeller components in here and it has to build every single one of them. So um, there we go. Now we're in business. So while we're at it, let's go out and take a look at this tip nacelle and we'll point out some of these areas that, uh, that will cause problems in the solver. So specifically, if we start here and show only, you'll see that there are vertical faces both here on say the inlet to the motor surface there are blunt faces down here on the back of the spinner there are blunt faces in between the motor and even in the simple version where you have all of this 
say, combined down to a single nacelle, these vertical faces exist. And so you want to try and avoid that by doing something like coming back to this section and picking a cross section. Here we go. Going out to the last cross section. So the closure is a point. You see that the delta x is like zero here because this is all built out of a stack. If we stretch that out just a little bit, something like, mm, let's give it half an inch. That might even be too much. So something like 0.1 or 0.05 is going to be plenty. Something like that is going to run in panel mode. It's going to run in VLM mode. Uh, it's not going to give you any issues. Um, so those are a few things that you can do to identify some, some issues with your solution. You can look for errors in your model. Um, those are some ways that you can avoid things that'll cause problems in your, your vortex lattice or your panel solutions. And, um, and really it's, it's, uh, it's where you should start when you're trying to troubleshoot some of these more complex models. And again, build things from the ground up, build your complexity as you go. Don't start with something like the X57 detailed model and and do something wild like expect to just turn on all of the propellers and get something meaningful out of the solver um, because chances are that's not going to work there's too much going on and in fact this model uh, the detailed version is more intended for building up either an outer mold line for component layup or for higher order cfd where all of these different components can spin so if you're just looking for something to run through VSP Aero, by all means, pick the simple one. And even then, you have to kind of refine it a little bit. Um, let's see here. So it's about 2.20. Uh, I tried to shave a little bit of that time back, so we had time for a little break uh, before M4 Engineering jumps on and um, and starts to give us some updates to, to their work over the last year or so. Um, Rob, are there any other questions that have popped up, or uh, does anybody want to see... Uh, a particular demonstration, I think. Uh... Um, there was there was one or two questions that I I think I've already answered. Um, I'd say you know I think it's always neat to just uh, do a very simple, you know, maybe a rotating blade case just to show folks who've uh, who've maybe never looked at that how quick and easy it is to set up. Um, oh, sure. And analyze a rotor. Yeah, we can do that, and uh, it'll be, I think that's a great idea, because that'll help us point out um, maybe some of the outputs that come and what we can use for that as well. So let's maybe set this to two, set this to one. Um, just for fun of it, let's say Mach 2. I know someone asked about a supersonic case. Um, not really sure what's going to happen here, but let's run it anyway. Yep, so, I mean, it ran. Um whether that is, uh, that's particularly meaningful with such a poorly resolved model, um, you know, but uh, it, it has, it, it will work. Uh, VLM mode runs supersonic cases, so, um, so go for that. So, all right, let's do a uh, propeller case. And in, in this one, let's just do an isolated propeller so it runs a little bit faster. We're going to add a default propeller, and let's take this down to something like, uh, say, a two-foot diameter and we'll run, actually, you know what? There's a better way to do this. Let's open um, our examples here. We're gonna do isolated rotor and we'll open this one. So this is an example that comes with OpenVSP that Dave Kinney has set up for the purposes of demonstrating this mode. And so you can see it's a five bladed prop. It's got a diameter of 10, it's, you know, relatively simple. And uh, we'll go ahead and jump into VSP Aero. And so under the Advanced tab, you'll see you turn on Rotating Blades. We'll give this a few more CPUs to make it run quicker. And you'll notice that there is both a free stream velocity, a reference velocity, and a mock reference. And as has been asked in the Google group numerous times, what's the difference? Well, for slow free stream cases and even zero free stream cases, you need either for actuator disks or in the case of rotating blades you'll want a reference velocity so that the solver has something to normalize everything 
So in this case, by turning on the VREF, you're telling it that the reference velocity that it should use for calculations is this value, and then it applies the free stream using a second value. You, you know, because this is all potential code, you can think of the reference velocity and the Mach number and even the, um, the Reynolds number as kind of disconnected from one, one, one another. So it's up to you to make sure that, uh, that all of these are scaled appropriately. We'll go ahead and give it some wake nodes and um, maybe give it some far field distance to make sure that we capture enough of the wake. And then here under the propeller tab is where you start playing around with some of the settings. So you'll notice that Dave talked about this 860 RPM. There's that. Uh, if you have multiple versions of this, you can tell it a uniform RPM and it will apply it to every single one of these rotors. And you can either have auto time stepping or you can set the time steps accordingly. So for this, let's just set it to auto time step, back it off to say six revolutions so we don't uh, spend all day doing this and make sure that all this stuff makes sense. Yep, looks good. And so from here, we're just going to launch the solver. And so what should happen is it's going to set everything up and you can see that because there aren't a whole lot of points, it's a linear twist, linear taper, it's a relatively simple propeller model. You can see that each one of these steps is only taking about three iterations to get down to convergence, which shows you that everything is behaving relatively well. And so even for the case where we're running six revolutions in an unsteady time stepping, this is going at a pretty decent clip. Now, again, I'm throwing eight processors at it and not using hyper threading, but you get the idea. You know, it may take a little bit longer on your machine, but it is, it's a very stable, uh, stable run. So while this is running, um, just keep in mind that, again, you want to use some best practices for your Vortex Lattice uh, setup. You want to make sure that your clustering is good on your blades, that you get more information out of the tips where, you know, your tip vortices are going to be. That's going to help the solver converge faster. That's going to help the run go faster. Um, so while this is plugging along, Rob, uh, have I missed anything in the chat or um, anything else going on? Um, in particular, someone asked if all these videos were going to be made, broken apart, and made available as uh, individual segments. Uh, yes. In <laughs> yes, absolutely. So uh, just like we did last year, uh, we are recording the live session, and I will cut all of these videos up into individual talks. So the as long as we'll have the slides from each of the presenters included uh, on the 2021 workshop page, and the video link to each individual talk will be right next to it. So it'll be just like the 2020 workshop. Yes. And that was the only, uh, that was the only question right now. There was a request to do a, um, a quadcopter in, in hover. And, um, you know, maybe if, if we still have time, I'm not sure that we will, but maybe if we still have time, you could do a, a minimal case of a quadcopter in hover, um, just for fun, but this uh, this will probably suffice. Yeah, I'll say, you know, for a for a quadcopter and hover, especially you know, rotating blades in in unsteady mode, um, VSB Aero, uh, at least from what I've seen, is going to do it, and it's going to do it pretty darn well. Um, especially if you do something like the hover ramp where you, you let it kind of ease down into hover and then stabilize. Um, Dave would be able to speak uh, much more accurately to the quality of that solution. Um, you know, I, I have relatively limited experience trying to run it uh, in that configuration, mostly because it, it takes quite a long time uh, and I haven't had a design that I've been particularly trying to, uh, to find. But if we have some time, uh, we we might be able to run an example case where we use, say, four rotors and piece them together and just put them around a body. Um, I know M4 is supposed to start here in about four minutes, um, which should be just enough time for us to take a look at this solution and uh, and take a look at some of the results and then move on. But I will let everybody online know that uh, M4 is scheduled to run to about 3.15. Uh, it's about a 45-minute talk. 
And if we have some time at the end of the day, which we should, um, we should have about half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, where we can come back and revisit some of these topics and kind of play around with OpenVSP a bit and do some you know, quick, easy demos uh, like that. So we should have time to come back and, and do some more demos uh, here after this, this next talk. So if we don't get to it, then, then we'll see. So we're just coming up on the last time step here. All right. And so what you're going to see here in the load distribution when the results manager comes up is the load distribution of your thrust coefficient. And in this, I think H is, uh, is what, Rob? Is that helicopter? Yeah, that's just a denotion. The, the helicopter community uses a different set of coefficients than propeller yes. community. And so the underscore H means that it's using the helicopter conventions, whereas when we don't have that underscore, it's, it means it's propeller conventions. All right. Yeah. So you'll see that, you know, we have all five of the blade surfaces, all of the, the loading is exactly the same. There's no really, there's not really reason it wouldn't be. Um, and then you can look at the actual load itself. So if we're talking about the lift coefficient per blade. But mostly, uh, you're probably going to be interested in the uh, unsteady solution. So you see it's kind of noisy here at the beginning, and then it loads up and kind of evens out. Um, so if we're looking at things like the thrust coefficient, you know, it gets nice and even and steady. But you'll see that you have different data type selections here, where you have the rotor, the group, and the history file. So the history, you'll see uh, what we want here, CFX. There's nothing here, you know, there were no bodies that contribute to the history file. And so there's, there are also no groups. All of these are rotor components. So if we get into a bit more of, say, the, the dynamic uh, groups input file, that's how VSP Arrow knows which one of these is which. So we can take a look at things like the torque coefficient, and you can see that it you know, gets nice and stable. Um, very quickly, before we jump on and uh, let M4 take over for their talk, we'll take a look at the solution in the viewer. And we'll throw some pressures on there and some trailing wakes. And notice that we have 121 of these solutions. So every single time step is included. And you can step through these. And as the wake advances, you can even hold this button down and it'll kind of animate a little bit. But the longer it builds up, the more information it has to keep track of. So you'll notice it starts to bog down a little. Just fast forward all the way to the end if you want to. And you can see the fully developed wake here in the background. And it shows you how all this is behaving. Now, if you run this and you start to see this wind up into a nasty tumbleweed or you see it doing um, some things to where it starts to bounce all over the place, chances are your time stepping is wrong or you have an improper resolution here on your blade. So um, beware of that. <laughs> 